Hello, I'm Christopher Still from Oregon State University, and I'm here to talk to you about plants and carbon isotope fractionation. And in particular, I'm going to focus on plants that use different photosynthetic pathways. All land plants use a common biochemical cycle for photosynthesis, shown here, in order to create sugars from atmospheric carbon dioxide in the presence of light. This is the so-called C3 photosynthetic carbon reduction cycle, named this way because the first products of the reaction have three carbon atoms. This cycle is also known as the Calvin-Benson cycle. The details of this cycle were worked out using careful laboratory experiments combined with radiocarbon tracers in Berkeley, California shortly after World War II by Melvin Calvin, Andrew Benson, James Bassam, and others. Melvin Calvin, shown here, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for this work in 1961. However, there are other biochemical variations of this cycle, and in particular one known as the C4 photosynthetic pathway. The C4 pathway, which was dis discovered after the C3 cycle by various scientists working with sugarcane in Hawaii and in Australia in the mid and early 1960s. C4 photosynthesis works like a turbocharger on the C3 cycle by concentrating higher carbon dioxide at the enzyme reaction sites inside plant cells, as shown here on the right. The C4 pathway is most common in grasses, where it first appeared some 25 to 35 million years ago. By raising intracellular carbon dioxide levels, C4 plants eliminate a wasteful biochemical reaction called photorespiration that is most damaging to C3 plants at higher temperatures and lower carbon dioxide levels. This is one reason why C4 grasses are most abundant in warm, tropical and subtropical grasslands and savannas, as shown in the map here and in the picture. The elimination of photorespiration in C4 plants has a wide variety of impacts on plant function, including generally higher growth rates and resource use efficiencies compared to C3 plants, as well as different responses to light, as shown in the upper left panel, responses to temperature, as shown in the lower left panel, and to carbon dioxide, as shown in the right-hand panel. The incredibly high photosynthesis and growth rates of C4 grasses lead to important ecological consequences. C4 plants provide something like 20 to 25 percent of global terrestrial primary productivity, despite comprising uh, less than 5 percent of vascular plant species diversity. C4 grasses are also hugely important as a food source for humanity. Prominent C4 crops uh, that humans eat include corn, sugarcane, sorghum, millet, and teff, as shown here. In the upper left panel, there's a farmer in a cornfield, and in the lower right, uh, we see a picture of sorghum crops. Because C4 grasses grow faster than almost any other plants, they're also prominent in use as biofuels. Examples include switchgrass, and sugarcane. And the figure here shows a map of the widespread distribution of switchgrass in the United States. And the picture shows the great size and growth rates these plants can attain. Because of their very high growth rates and ability to respond to disturbances, C4 grasses are also some of the worst and most invasive weed species. They often outcompete native plants and can even change the fire cycle and associated nutrient and water cycling. The pictures here show invasive C4 grasses in Arizona and in Hawaii. Importantly, the distinct biochemistry and anatomy of the C4 photosynthetic pathway also lead to large differences in the carbon isotope composition of C4 plants compared to C3 plants, as is shown in the figure here. This large isotopic distinction has been used by scientists in a wide variety of fields to study food webs and trophic interactions, human diet, carbon cycle processes, and even animal migrations. The distinct isotopic composition of C3 and C4 plants results from differences in isotope fractionation that are driven by biochemical and anatomical changes associated with the two pathways. During photosynthesis, plants open tiny pores on their leaves called stomata. One of these is shown in the upper left-hand figure here. Stomata opening allow 
for the diffusion of carbon dioxide into plant leaves. However, this opening inevitably results in the loss of water since there is a higher concentration of water vapor inside leaves than outside leaves. Thus, flows of carbon dioxide and water vapor are tightly coupled and controlled by the relative opening and closing of these stomatal pores. Carbon dioxide diffuses into leaves during the day because the concentration of this gas inside leaves is lower than in the surrounding environment. This carbon dioxide is used in photosynthesis as described previously. A plant has to balance the supply of carbon dioxide needed for photosynthesis with a supply that can diffuse through the stomatal pores, as is shown in the figure here. Consequently, the concentration of carbon dioxide inside leaves remains fairly constant as the plant tries to balance the demand for CO carbon dioxide and the supply of carbon dioxide. A key insight in understanding C3 plant carbon isotope fractionation was the realization that it depends on the ratio of intracellular to atmospheric carbon dioxide. Specifically, the various physical and biological fractionations that occur as carbon dioxide is transported to the reaction sites of photosynthesis are additive and weighted by the relative drawdown in carbon dioxide along this pathway, as is shown in the figure here. The most important terms in this equation at the bottom are the kinetic fractionation that occurs due to relative differences in molecular diffusion as gases pass through the stomata, and this is termed A in the equation, along with the kinetic fractionation by the primary photosynthetic Rubisco enzyme as it reacts with carbon dioxide, denoted B in this equation. In practice, the simplified form of the equation shown here captures the diffusive and enzymatic fractionations and works well for most situations. This figure shows the linear relationship between isotope fractionation in C3 plants and the ratio of intercellular to atmospheric carbon dioxide, which is denoted as Ci over Ca. Finally, although there are more complex equations for C4 plant carbon isotope fractionation that also depend on the ratio of intercellular to atmospheric carbon dioxide, in most C4 type plants, carbon isotope fractionation is well approximated by the same kinetic fractionation value that captures relative differences in molecular diffusion as gases pass through the stomata. Thanks for watching this video. I hope you've learned something about plants and carbon isotope fractionation and the many ways in which this can be applied to scientific questions.